thank you, Laura, for that wonderful introduction. I sure would like to meet the guy you were talking about, because I, I don't think I can live up to that standard. But it's wonderful to see you all here. You know, I, I sometimes wonder when you put mathematics in the title of a talk if maybe you're going to be lecturing to a bunch of empty seats and some crickets. So it's nice to see you all here. And I, I appreciate it, and I hope that it's worth your hour. Uh, I do have so much to talk about. And in my classes, it's a three-week uh, section of my Math 10 class. And in Laura's class, it's a, a one and a half hour lecture, but I promise I'm not going to go over. Uh, the clock's up there, and I know that you guys are all busy. I'm trying to do it in the one hour. I had lots of coffee, so <laughs> we should be good. It's always nerve-wracking to talk to a large crowd, so I have this cannabis dispenser hooked up. Uh, that should <laughs> help out. It's my first time giving a lecture to this large of an audience with this thing on, so it's a little awkward, but um, we'll try. Anyway. My talk today is on the mathematics of the Maya calendars. And the S is not an accident. The Maya had several calendars that they used, and I want to talk about several of them today. Um, but I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, that's so 2012. Uh, <laughs> you know, that was a big deal then. Why are you still talking about this? Well, why would I write a new talk when I can still get money off of this one? Uh, <laughs> but honestly, this is something that I'm really interested in. It's something I'm passionate about. And I, I've been studying for a long time, and uh, I'm just a beginner in it. But I, I just love sharing this information with people. And hopefully, it'll spur you to maybe explore a little in a little more depth about this. And the other reason also is that the mathematics and the contributions and the accomplishments of the native peoples of the Americas are often overlooked. And I think it's important to, to go back and maybe revisit some of the things that they did accomplish, uh, even if we've lost them. And today's tale is that it's a, a tale of mathematics created, and mathematics lost, and mathematics rediscovered, along with culture that was developed, lost, and rediscovered and recovered. So hopefully you'll get some of that from my talk. All right. So, but let's not, uh, let's not wait till the end to talk about the most exciting part. What was going on in 2012? There was supposed to be that big Maya apocalypse, which of course, it didn't happen, so we'll call it the no-pocalypse. But what was going on in the media at that time? It's starting. Holy. Oh, that doesn't look good. It's not just California. It's the whole world. And 12, maybe PG-13, November 13. Uh, well, OK. Maybe Hollywood isn't the best place to go for facts about culture. All right, so let's get rid of that. But it's good to know that even though it was the end of the world, it was only rated PG-13. So how bad can it be? We could go to that other bastion of truth and honesty, the internet. And if you looked up <laughs> what was happening in 2012 on the internet, you would find that the Earth's magnetic field was going to suddenly flip on December 21st, 2012. Or there would be drought and crop failure. Well, if you think about things, the, the magnetic field of the Earth does occasionally flip, and it's showing signs of weakening now, and maybe it will. But to attribute that occurrence to happening on one particular day is a very odd thing. And drought and crop failure is going on all the time. My colleague, Rick Lettman from Sonoma State, once said, it's amazing how much energy and time we spend worrying about apocalyptic events that are out of our control, and how little time and energy we'll put into solving our real problems, like the global climate change that's causing maybe the drought and crop failure. So an interesting idea that we get very excited about apocalyptic events. Oops. What else could you find out that in December 2012, the real Maya would return? Return from where? From another dimension or outer space. This started back in the 60s with a book called Chariots of the Gods. Well, it started before then, probably, but this particular myth started in the 60s with a book, Chariots of the Gods, that was then made into a movie. And this is a picture of the sarcophagus lid to King Pakal of Palenque in southern Mexico, a Mayan king. Clearly, he's riding a spaceship there. You can see tubes going in his nose. He's working controls. Flames, jets shooting out the back. So the Maya are going to come back. How insulting. This is a 
total disregard for Maya culture. It's a total uh, transplant of maybe some of our ideas onto something that they created without ever bothering to look at what it actually means. This isn't King Pakal flying off into space in a rocket. This is King Pakal, who has died in the fetal position, falling into the double-jawed serpent's mouth, the entrance to the underworld. And that's not a rocket ship he's riding. That's actually a tree, the tree of life. And in fact, right there is the Maya symbol, word for tree. It's written right on it. Hey, I'm a tree, not a rocket ship. <laughs> this is the sacred tree whose roots extend into the underworld and whose canopy extends into the heaven. It connects the worlds together. And if you think, well, that cruciform shape isn't really what a tree looks like, the ceiba tree down in Mexico and Central America grows exactly like that. This made it very easy for the Catholic missionaries to convert the Maya to Catholicism, because what's the great symbol of Catholicism is the cross, and what was the great symbol for the Maya? Also this cruciform shape. If you go into a traditional Maya home, you'll often find a Christian cross, but it'll be painted green, and there'll be vines painted on it as well, because it represents the tree of life as well as the, the cross, Christian cross. So why is this the most insulting thing that I've ever heard? That the Maya will return? Because the Maya never went anywhere. The Maya are still living and working and playing and loving and raising families in the same place that they have lived and worked, loved and raised families for thousands and thousands of years. And they're still there, five or six million people. And that place here is Central America, uh, down in the peninsula of the Yucatan, Belize, Guatemala, into Honduras, and El Salvador. Today's talk is going to be a mix of history, anthropology, and mathematics. And I'm not an expert in any of those things. So you get my version, my take on things. Anthropologists divide up the history of the Maya into several periods. The one that is going to be the focus of most of our work is the classic period. This is the era of the great city-states, from about 200 AD, or CE as we say now, to 900 CE, well before Europeans came and stayed in the Americas. Anthropologists have, and archaeologists and people who study the Maya have creatively named the surrounding periods pre-classic and post-classic, very creative. We also, you know, as it ends at the 1500s, why? What happened in the 1500s? The Spanish conquest. So we also have the conquest, the post-conquest, and the modern era. We'll begin our history with this guy, Fray Diego de Landa. Born in the 1500s, he was a Franciscan priest, a missionary, came over to the Americas to convert the peoples of the Yucatan. King Charles of Spain and the Pope had granted the Franciscans exclusive rights to convert the people of the Yucatan. So he came over here as a 20-year-old. And you'll see the influence of some events in Spain just, just prior to his birth, so a couple decades before he was born. What was going on in Spain? The Spanish Inquisition. It's funny. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> Monty Python fans? No, okay, maybe. All right, so. Um, but what he did when he got here was he decided that he would walk alone across the Yucatan Peninsula. This was just after the conquest. Europeans were not looked upon very fondly by the native peoples, and most people would not leave a settlement without a squad of soldiers with them. But he chose to walk alone and talk to the Maya and learn about their culture. And they respected that. They admired his courage. And they shared with him their sacred writings, their teachings, their rituals. But the Landa was a snake. He was not here to preserve their culture. He wanted to learn about it so it was better to destroy it and convert people to Catholicism. And this was going on all over the Americas. There were voices that said, no, we need to preserve the culture, but they were drowned out by the overwhelming majority. <clears throat> and here, at the site of his church, in the town of Manian, Mexico, on the Yucatan Peninsula, he sent out his troops. Uh, and his priests, and they went to the Maya homes, and they collected all they could of the Maya iconography and books 
and whatever they had of Maya culture, and he burned it all in a bonfire here in front of his church. And here's a picture of him, a painting that hangs in the office of the governor in Merida. And he wrote, we found a large number of books in these characters, and as they contained nothing which were not to be seen as superstition and lies of the devil, we burned them all, which they, the Maya, regretted to an amazing degree, and which caused them much affliction. So effective was this purge that at this time we have four Maya texts. Four texts remain from this very literate culture. Can you imagine if invaders came to our culture and took everything that we had and destroyed everything except for four books? These four books that were saved were just kind of randomly saved. But what if you could choose what four books would you choose to represent our culture? I'll make it easier. Only one can be your math text. <laughs> you know, that's not even the whole Harry Potter series. What are you going to do? I, it would be an impossible choice. These texts are fig bark covered with a lime paste or plaster and then hand painted. And the Dresden Codex is 79 pages, 39 pages front and back, folded accordion style. It's called the Dresden Codex because it was rediscovered in a museum in Dresden. And all of the codices that we have are named after the locations where they resided, not where they were discovered because we don't know. And perhaps they were sent home as tribute to people who had funded explorations and conquests. Uh, but they ended up in these museums, and that's how we know them. We don't know their original source. But look at all that writing. I wonder what it says. Well, we'll talk a little bit about that. We also have, to preserve their culture, many stone monuments, including the largest stone monument in the Americas, there at Quirigua. It's over 35 feet high and intricately carved on all exposed surfaces, saying something. But what? So these stela are, um, are quite impressive. Delanda's abuses of the native peoples were so severe that he was actually recalled to the Vatican and put on trial for these abuses. Now, as happens, he was acquitted and promoted and sent back to the Yucatan to become the first bishop of the area. He had done a very effective job in converting people to Catholicism. But while he was there back in Europe, he wrote a book about what he had learned about the Maya culture. So Delanda is looked upon as both a horror for having destroyed so much of the culture, but also he's the only one who wrote a book that would preserve some of the culture. So he's kind of a mixed bag here to some people. And this particular page of his book about the Yucatan and about the culture was, well, this particular book was written in 1566. The original was lost, but copies were made, fortunately, and rediscovered in the 1800s. And the most important part here is this page for us, which could have proved to be a Rosetta Stone for interpreting the Maya glyphs. What Delanda did was he asked his informant to help him translate the Spanish alphabet. So he would say, hey, how would you write the letter B if you were going to carve in stone or paint on this page something? And the Maya informant would show him, and he, he copied it down here. Now, this was a misunderstanding, again, of Maya culture and Maya, Maya language, it led to a lot of false starts and a lot of dead ends. There are about 800 symbols that we see in the Maya texts and stone carvings. That's way too many to be an alphabet, but way too few to be a logographic system like the Chinese use, where you have thousands and thousands of symbols to represent ideas and concepts. The Maya language is written in such a way that each symbol represents a consonant and a vowel. So if you say, hey, the letter B, there's a symbol that makes the sound B. But there's also one for bow, for boo, for ba. So you get lots more symbols, but not enough to be a logographic system. And this wasn't discovered until the 50s, 1950s. This man is also responsible for a lot of misunderstandings about the Maya. jean Frederick Baldeck, first of all, check out how long he lived, 109 years. That's pretty amazing. He claimed to have been born in Paris, Prague, Vienna. He claimed to have been a duke or an earl. 
He claimed to have been on expeditions to Africa and the Middle East. It was said that he never let the truth get in the way of a good story. But he was a well-known painter, and he had a powerful patron, Lord Kingsborough. And the city of Palenque had recently been discovered, and Lord Kingsborough sent Valdeck to the Americas to paint what he saw. And there in the Temple of Inscriptions, there's a giant panel full of carvings. And if you look up uh, Temple of Inscriptions painting, you'll still get a picture of this painting online, and you can purchase it if you want. But check this out. What do you see here? That's a what? An elephant. Is there any ele elephants in the Americas? No. Clear evidence that the Maya were either from or communicated with Africa or Asia. Awesome. And this was published in a book in Europe. Well, it was a common belief at the time, and one that his sponsor, the man paying his bills, believed that Palenque and the cities that were being rediscovered in the Americas were from the lost city of Atlantis, the lost culture of Atlantis. So he was looking maybe for ties. Now, did he see the elephant or did he, uh, in, in the carvings, or did he just put it there to please his patron? It's hard to say. But here's a more recent drawing by Linda Sheely, uh, an anthropologist from the University of Texas. The same six panels, look at that bottom left. That doesn't look like an elephant. And here's a photograph. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't think it's an elephant. All right, we'll go on. Constantine Raffinesque, an amazing person who had contributions, significant contributions in many fields. He was a significant contributor to botany, especially here in the Americas. He was a very successful businessman, retired at the age of 25, and spent his time doing what he wanted. And he built a collection of uh, new species after having lost the one he had built in Europe when his ship foundered on the way here. I think there were 50 cases of books and species that he had collected that were lost. But he slowly rebuilt that. But he also was looking at one of these pages of the Maya texts. And these had never been translated. No, notice now, here we're into the 1800s. It's been 300 years since the Spanish conquest, 300 years of cultural suppression. There may not have been anyone alive at this point who could read the texts, who could inter interpret the stone carvings. And he looked at this and he said, you know, I see a bunch of dots and bars. That's more bars than I see on a Saturday night. Not really. No, I hit, I don't really hit it. <clears throat> but he said, but if I look at the dots, I see one dot, I see two dots, three dots, four dots, but I never see more than four dots together. And then I see all these bars. So he said, you know, I think these are numbers. And I think the dot represents one. And since I never see more than four dots, I think that the bar represents five. And indeed, that's the case. We have dots and bars to represent Maya numerals, Maya numbers. So here's some examples. I might write something like this. No, no, so I'm writing it kind of horizontally, and they stacked it the other way, or maybe this is vertically. The bars were horizontal the other way. You'll see them both ways. You'll see them both ways. So this would be, well, one, two, three dots. That would be three plus a bar is five. So that would be, what do you think that would represent? Yeah, eight, right? Five plus three is eight. You good with that? All right, so now a little louder, because I can't hear. I have hearing aids. I just, they don't work so well. What do you think that number is? Twelve, yeah, two fives and two, two ones. Twelve, nice work. All right. Let's talk about our system. We need 10 symbols, zero through nine. And we have a base 10 number system. Why do you think we have a base 10 number system? Well, we have 10 fingers, huh? It's kind of natural when you're counting to have a base 10 system. You know, local tribes here in this area, some of them had a base 8 counting system because they didn't count on their fingertips. They counted by using counting sticks in the spaces between. And there are eight spaces between. So 10 is a very common base around the world. So is 5. But notice we don't need any symbols more than these 10. Why not? Because we have something that the Roman numerals didn't have, place values. That's awesome. What do place values do? Well, they allow us to use the same digits over and over to represent different values. If I put it in the first position, it's a 1. If I put it uh, in the second position, it's worth 10. 
So if I have a number like this, 96, you know, the way Roman numerals work, you just add up the symbols, right? You see an X and a V, that's a 10 and a 5, it's 15. But this isn't 15. This is 96. What do we mean by 96? We mean 9 10s and 6 1s. And you're going, yeah, of course. Why are you telling us this? Well, just to get you in the mood, I guess. <laughs> We'd never see, if you looked at a table of numbers or calculations or any math book, you'll never see a digit bigger than 9, because we don't need it. The place value gives it the value. The Roman numerals, every time you go up, you need a new symbol. So you have to create symbols. It gets a little cumbersome there to write 96. That's 50 and then four tens. But that's an additive system. One of the things that the Romans didn't have was a zero. What would be the point? Right? Suppose I had a symbol for zero. I could add it on there, but it wouldn't add anything. But we need it. Otherwise, how can I tell the difference between 96 and 960 or 906? I need it to hold that position. So zero is a big deal. In fact, it's a very uncommon idea. There are only three ancient cultures that developed zero. The Sumerians, the Babylonians, and the Maya. The Hindu developed it later, and then it spread to Europe. But it wasn't in common use in Europe until the 1500s. So here, <coughs> we're seeing it in use much earlier. Let's go back to this page. See if you can find the biggest number that you can see. I'll circle one there. That's 11, but you should be able to find something bigger. Every number around it is bigger. 13 to the right, 16 to the left, right? Three bars and a. Did you find a big number? Yeah. Yeah, 19. Right there. 19. If you look through all the codices, all the stone monuments, you never see a number, a digit larger than 19. Which means either the Maya never counted past 19 or they were using a base 20 system. Just like we never count, have a digit bigger than 9. Why? Because when we get to 10, we go to positions. That's what the Maya had, a base 20 system. Does it make sense to you why a human being might develop a base 20 system? Right? We use base 10, but if you look down, base 20. 20 was the number of a human being, a complete human. 20. So they used a base 20 system, which means that their positions weren't 1s and 10s, but 1s and 20s, 1s and 20s. And they didn't write them horizontally like we do, where we have a 1s place and then a 10s place. They stacked them vertically, 1s place and then a 20s place. But in order to have a positional system like that, you need a 0. The other symbol that you see all over the codices is a shell. And that shell isn't Terry, but that shell is a zero. And this is written in other ways, too, different shells. That shell represented the zero. That was the placeholder. So what's the value of this two-digit Maya number? Now, OK, how do we figure this out? Well, remember. Because you know I'm all about Debbie's, about Debbie's, no trouble. I'm it's all, all about, about the base. Debbie's. What was the base of the Maya system? 20. So what does this mean? This is a two dot, dot. What's this here? 10. This isn't 2, though. It's 2 20s. What's 2 20s? 40. 40 plus another 10 is? Excellent. This Maya two-digit number is 50. And I took that right off of a Guatemalan 50 quetzale note. See it over there on the right-hand corner? All the Maya money has a, uh, all the Guatemalan money, I should say, has the regular numbers that we use, plus the Maya numeral over there somewhere on the number. It gets more complicated. When you look at the stone monuments, they get eroded. But the Maya hated blank spaces, so they sometimes would carve a little ring. Rather than just leaving two dots, this should be seven, but they'd put this ring here. But with erosion, I can never tell if these are rings or if they're actually counted. And sometimes they wouldn't put the number at all. They'd just count these, they'd carve these faces into stone. And that represented the number. And you would see 0 represented in a different way, either with that face or with that symbol there. There's other ways to represent it, and I'll show you a couple here. Let's see. This first symbol is called a partially obscured quadrifoil. It's supposed to be a four-leaf flower that you only see part of. 
This face here, notice with the hand over the jaw. That's the giveaway that you're talking about zero. And sometimes just the hand. The hand was a symbol for zero, but it was also a symbol for completion, which is kind of an interesting idea. In Kirigua, that stone monument that I showed you earlier, 35 feet tall, right there, that whole square is devoted to carving that full figure. But notice the hand over the jaw. That whole square represents what? Think about the time and energy it takes to carve something in stone. Well, first to create some stone miles and miles over to the site where you're going to erect it, and then to carve it, all that to put in zero. That was pretty important to them. So what is this talking about here? Well, we'll get to that. But before we do, let's finally get to the calendars. And we'll talk about this guy, Ernst Forstmann. He was the first person to decipher the calendars for us in the West. His father was a high school math teacher in Germany. He understood mathematics and studied mathematics, but his passion was linguistics. That's what he got his degree in. And his job was to be the librarian at the Royal Library in Dresden, where resided the Dresden Codex. So you've got the right guy at the right time with the right background. This is one of those coincidences of history where anybody else might have flubbed this, but he figured this out. He published lots of papers, but no one else was studying this. And he wrote, may someone check and correct me where I err, but investigate further in this young science wherever I'm right, because I work singly and scarcely hear applause or criticism from the few who are so qualified. He sounds very lonely. <laughs> the Maya had several calendars, but the first I want to talk to you about is the Tzolkim calendar. And this was a sacred calendar used for performing rituals, uh, and um, <clears throat> the day keepers who keep the calendar would perform their ceremonies based on the days and the divinations. And it's a cycle of numbers, 13 numbers, 1 through 13, and 20 named days. Now, you can always tell a Tzolkin date because the symbol's carved inside one of these shapes, which we call a cartouche. Looks like an old TV set. But <clears throat> the way this works is a lot like ours. Here are the day names, Imish, Ik, Akbal, Khan, Chichan, and so forth. And there were 20 of them. They were named after gods. We do the same thing. Today's Monday, named after the moon. Wednesday is Odin's day. Thursday is Thor's day. Friday, that's old German for Iron Man Day, I think. Maybe all of them, Thor, I don't know. Maybe it's Spider-Man, I can't remember. This is like our day name. Today is Monday, tomorrow is Tuesday. In fact, today is Monday the 23rd, tomorrow is Tuesday the 24th. This works the same way. Every day the name changes, but so does the number. So if I started with one Imish, I'd go to two Ik, three Akbal, four Khan, et cetera, et cetera, and I would continue Somewhere down here, whoops, right here, I would get to 12 ebb, 13 bend. Now I'm out of numbers. So I start over. We have a seven day name cycle. We never run out of numbers first. We always run out of day names first, because we have 30 days in a month, or 28, or 29, or 31, depending. But then we'd come to one ish, two men. And we'd continue down until we got to seven ahau. And then we'd run out of names, so it would be Eight imish, we'd start back over. So we ask ourselves, how many days would it be if we started with one imish to get back to one imish? Well, if I go 20 days, I'm back to eight imish. Huh. Well, in math, this is what we call the least common multiple of 13 and 20. And since these two numbers share no common factors, we can just take 13 times 20 and say this is a 260-day sacred calendar a 260-day sacred calendar. We often visualize it like this. Notice again, I have here two, uh, I should again, notice I have these gears. This is a modern construct. This is not how the Maya viewed it, despite the fact that they've made this up to look really nice and old. The numbers one, two, three, four, all the way around to 13. And then here we have Amish, Ik, Akbal, Khan, the same names as before. And if I were to click this once, I would go from one Amish to two Ik, then to three, Akbal, et cetera, et cetera. But a circle like this has no beginning and has no end. 
That list I showed you at the beginning started with Amish. And in the Yucatan, many of the people who would keep, uh, be day keepers there would start with Amish if you asked them to list the days. But in the highlands, the Maya highlands, they would often start with whatever day it was today. So today is Manik, tomorrow is Lamat. So if they would list the days, they would say, oh, today's Manik, Lamat, and so on and so forth. It didn't make sense where do you start and where do you end when you have a cycle. But why 260 days? Well, that's just a property of 13 and 20. Those are two special numbers for the Maya. Base 20, 20, the number of a human. There's also 13 major joints in the body at which disease can enter. The neck, shoulders, elbows, wrists, hips. If you want more, you're going to have to get out those dollar bills. <laughs> Knees and ankles. If you count those up, there's 13 of them. So these two numbers come together in their calendar. They're also important numbers in their uh, view of life. And they just make 260. It's a mathematical property. Others say it's because of zenith passages at an important city in Mayan, uh, uh, Mayan history. But my favorite explanation is that in the Maya way of counting, a human pregnancy lasts 260 days. Now, we know a solar year is 365 days. That leaves 105 days out. But if you were to take a seed of corn and plant it, you would harvest it after 105 days. So think about this beautiful symmetry of human pregnancy, where you plant a seed, and it comes forth as a human being 260 days later. And then you plant a seed of corn that's going to sustain that human being, and you harvest it 105 days later to make up the year. I think that's just a beautiful symmetry. And I get tingly every time I talk about it. That's the first calendar. Two cycles running together to form a 260-day cycle. The Hob calendar is something maybe used more for planting. It's called the vague year. It's 365 days, no leap years. So that's why it's called vague. It tends to drift. There were 18 months of 20 days each, plus one five-day month called Wayab. If we start with the first month of Pope, then the way this works is the same way our months and days work. I, I don't mind. Come on in and find a seat. It's fine if you want. So one Pope, two Pope, three Pope, up to 19 Pope, then of course, 20 Pope. Then one woe, two woe, month of woe. Maybe that's finals, I don't know. We didn't call, uh, or in most carvings, they didn't actually ever write 20 Pope. Instead, they would say the seating of woe, like we would say New Year's Eve. Notice how convenient this is. By only going up to 19, we never have to get into a two-digit number in our carving. We just carve the seating of woe. So it still follows that kind of base 20 system, but to make it fit the, the year, we add that five-day month at the end. So today, for us, is Monday. That's our day name. September, that's our day month. 23rd, that's our day number. For the Maya, in the Tzolkin calendar, it would be one Manik. A day name plus a day number. We don't have that. And that's how they would write that, one Manik. The Hob calendar is 15 Chen. So remember how this works. This is like our month number. So tomorrow would be 16 Chen. Today is 15 Chen. There's the picture. And tomorrow we'd say, oh, the day name changes, but the month stays the same. The month number goes up one. And same for the Maya. The day name changes. So does the day number, two Lamat in the Tzolkin calendar, 16 Chen in the um, Hob calendar. Together. These two form a larger cycle. If we look at these gears again, right here we have four ahau, eight sec. Four ahau is the Tolkien date, eight sec is the uh, Hob date. If we were to click this once in this direction, we'd get five imish, nine sec. And we can say, well, how long does it take until we get back to four ahau, eight sec? We got a 260-day Tzolkin cycle to get back to four ahau, a 360-day, five-day Hob cycle to get back to eight sec. But after 365 days, I'm not going to be at four ahau again. I'm going to be off in the Tzolkin cycle. So again, this is least common multiple to the rescue, but a lot harder because 260 and 365 have common factors. 
It turns out that the least common multiple is 52 times 365. 52 Hob cycles. 73 times 260, 73 Tolkien cycles. Now remember, a Hob cycle is about a year. So that means that every 52 years, we complete a calendar round. So when you turn 52, actually 13 days short, because there's 13 leap years in your 52 years. 13 days short of your 52nd birthday, you would have a big celebration, because it will be the exact same Solkine and Hob date as the day you were born. So I hope that you're planning to celebrate. You can invite me. Wait a minute. No leap years. Everyone talks about the accuracy of the Maya calendar. What are they talking about? Well, let's look at our calendar. There's 365 days a year. We add extra days every four years. That's the leap year. But you know, we don't do that on the centuries. Oh, except we do every century that's divisible by 400. So in 2000, we had a leap year, February 29th. But we didn't in 1900. This gives us 365 days a year for 400 years, plus 100 leap years minus the three that didn't occur, gives us a total of 146,000 and some days spread over 400 years. Our calendar gives an average of 365.2425 days per year. Compare that to the modern value. We're off by three days every 10,000 years. Yeah, that's pretty close. After a few rounds of 10,000 years, we'll have to adjust because solstices will be off, plantings will be off. How about the Maya calendar? They had 365 day year two, but they didn't adjust it. But they also didn't worry about adjusting it. We adjust our calendar and go through those gyrations because we want the solstice to be on December 21st every year. What's it going to be in 10 years? December 21st. But another way to have an accurate calendar is to say, well, when's solstice going to be in 10 years? And for me to tell you what day. To make the adjustments. I don't have to have it be on the same day. I can just tell you when it's going to occur. And that tells me that I know the length of the solar year. Now, there's evidence in Copan, not everyone agrees with this, but there's evidence in Copan that 29 calendar rounds is equivalent to 1,507 solar years. 29 calendar round, that's 52 Hob cycles gives us 550,000 plus days spread over 1,507 years. That gives an answer like that. That's off four days every million years. Hmm. Pretty accurate, if true. The Maya were incredibly observant of the sky, right? There's nothing to do, no Kardashians to keep up with at that point. But the sky is amazing and filled with wonderful events. And <clears throat> so imagine how much work it took to develop a calendar like that with no telescopes, no GPS. This is all by naked eye observation. Another thing that Forstmann did was interpret these five pages. And keep that in mind as we talk about these pages, the, the observations required. He noticed that each of these five pages of the Dresden Codex had the same set of numbers there at the bottom. Do you remember how to do that number, that first, that first stack? What would that be? That's 11 what? 11 20s plus another 16. That's 236. The next would be four 20s, that's 80, plus another 10 would be 90. Those four numbers appear at the bottom of each of these pages, and that's 584. Does that mean anything to you? meant nothing to me, but to Forstmann, he knew. That's the length of time it takes, if you're watching Venus, for Venus to go from one point in the sky around to be a morning star to an evening star and back to the same point in the sky. These five pages are Tolkien and Hobb dates for, the six, for 65 cycles of Venus. That's about 100 years worth, 104 years. 65 cycles of Venus from high point to disappearing, to reappearing to high point. You know, and not every culture knew that the evening star and the morning star were the same star. They didn't recognize that, but the Maya knew that. Why 65 cycles, you say? Because 65 cycles of 584 days is the same as 104 times 365. What's that mean? It means it's an even number for the Hobbes cycles. And it's an even number for the Tolkien cycles. 
So if you're looking at Venus, then by the time you finish this chart, you can go right back to the beginning, and you'll be at the same Tolkien date, the same Hob date, and you can start this over. Now, how many centuries of data collection would it require to become aware of that? That's knowledge passed on from generation to generation. That's an amazing feat. The third calendar, and this is the one that generated the hysteria about the apocalypse. This is just a linear count of days. Let's start today. Today's one. Tomorrow's two. Next day's three. We'll just keep going. That's what the Maya did. But they chose an ancient date to start. So we have keens, those are days. Then weenals, which are months, 20-day months. Then tunes. In base 20, really, we should be using 20 times 20 here. But they used 18 times 20. We don't know why, but we think it's because 360 is closer to a year than 400. But then cartoons and box tunes. And this is how we write it today. We put numbers in each of those separated by a dot, a number from 0 to 19. It starts on August 11th, 3114 BC. But notice it doesn't start on one Amish, it starts on four Ahau, eight Kung Ku. What was going on there on that day? Well, at that point in time, the lords of the underworld had killed the maze god. But fortunately, his head survived on a tree, and he was able to impregnate one of the daughters who ran away and gave birth to her own twins, the hero twins. And these hero twins came back, and they resurrected their father, the maze god, and created and initiated this creation, wiped out the old creation, began a new creation. It's a wonderful story. So the magical acts of the hero twins resurrected their father, the maze god. They set the three hearthstones, which you'll find in a traditional Maya home. They cook over that. But you'll also find them in the sky in the constellation of Orion, the three that form the triangle. And the nebula in Orion is the fire. And then we just add one each day. Notice it went from 13.0.0.0.0, 13 Bach tunes, to zero. We started over. Why? A new creation. Five Amish, nine Kumku. So today, this is our long count date. 13 Bach tunes, 13.00 Ka tunes, six tunes, six about years, 15 months of 20 days and seven days. And tomorrow, we just add one to that, and it'll be eight days. This is the tale, the tale of creation that's told on Stila'i and Kirigua, that large monument. They carved the dates and the story about Maya creation, one version of Maya creation. Here's a monument at Tony Nod. You can see um, how this works. This was a stone monument erected, and you can see up here there's this introductory glyph. This will give an emblem that says, hey, oh, we are almost out of time, huh? All right, so I will quickly go through this. It says, hey, <coughs> we got a year here, got 10 Bach tunes, four Ka tunes, zero tunes, zero weenals, and then it's broken. That's all right. It's probably zero, but if we're not, we're only off by 19 days, and we have 909 CE. All right, I will go out of that, and I will skip down to the end here, or to a couple things. We'll have time to play this one. This is the inspiration for the apocalypse. Tortuguera Monument 6 in Mexico. We'll read Maya monuments this way. Two columns. We go across and down like a newspaper. If we start over here, we see completion of 13 Bach tunes. Four a how, three conkeen. It's going to happen that it's broken. It doesn't say end of the world. And yet, that's what people interpret it to mean. It's going to be the end of the world. There were plenty of Maya sites that have dates later. For example, this, uh, the Temple of Inscriptions has a date projecting much further beyond December 2012, and much further beyond than today. So they didn't think the world was going to end, doesn't seem. Uh, we will skip that. And we'll go down to this guy, not Mayan, but famous, nonetheless. Most famous speech, the Gettysburg Address. 
And what did he say in the Gettysburg Address? Four score and seven years ago. Score, that's 20. He's talking Maya, base 20. Why was he doing that? The Battle of Gettysburg was horrendous. Many people lost their lives and were horribly maimed. And he was talking about and relating the events of that day back to an event of cultural significance for us, the Revolutionary War, where our nation was established. And so lending the import, this cultural import, of our creation as a nation to the events of that day. And that's the way Maya used dates. They would use future uh, dates, like ends of Bach tunes, to lend importance to what was going on that day. All right, let's see. We will come down here, and we'll finish right on time. David Christensen is an anthropologist at BYU. Here's what he said. Hey, the world is going to die. Oh, what? Well, then he went on to say, the Maya believe the world dies every day when the sun sets. And the role of the daykeeper is to make sure they get things going again. So think about this, this beautiful sentiment. The world ends every day, and every dawn is a chance for you to recreate yourself, to recreate the world, maybe as a better world, maybe as a place. And isn't that why we're all here at the JC? We're trying to recreate our lives or turn our lives into something better. So what a beautiful way to think about the end of a day and the end of a cycle, the day, the shortest of our cycles that we count. So apocalyptic events were not on the Maya radar. They were thinking in terms of cycles, in terms of rebirths and rebeginnings, new beginnings. So since we're out of time, I will say this is the end, but since it's a cycle, it's also the beginning. I will hang out in the lobby for a little bit if you have questions, but I know that many of you have to go to classes. So thank you. There's not a class in the transition period? Yeah. Okay. I, so Laura says that I can take some questions if you'd like to ask them. Um, here, that's fine. Yes. How much of that did Valdek do? Say again, how much of it is? How much of that did Valdek do? Did Valdek? Uh, so I don't know how. Valdek only went to paint. So he created those, those paintings. The question was, how much did Valdek contribute? But pretty much just the paintings. Um, and his paintings, they had elephants. The pyramids, he made them look a little more Egyptian than they were Mayan. So uh, his contributions were maybe to mislead the people of Europe, I think. That would be my opinion. <laughs>